it is my distinct pleasure oh dear. to welcome you to the inner sanctum to explore the virtual hive of the digital bees. <laughs> <laughs> the bees include Bonnie B, Warren B, Diane B, and I am your guide and beekeeper, Mark B. <laughs> it is our honor to be here with you on this, our 10th annual collaborative presentation, bringing you innovative tools and pedagogical perturbations for early childhood classrooms. <laughs> Once again, it is our goal to leave you enthralled, informed, and inspired. So I'll do a short introduction, kind of frame uh, sort of all of our work and some of the conceptual elements that uh, underpin this, uh, and then each of us will give a, um, a presentation. So while this is our 10th, we want to start by recognizing another auspicious anniversary the fifth year of the technology and interactive media position statement. And so Chip Donahue, Roberta Schomburg, and with some contribution from the members of the Technology and Young Children Interest Forum, worked for years to develop, refine, and codify a statement of principles. And it has been a wonderful thing. Thank you, Chip. So it's principles, but it's also practice. Uh, and it really has held up well. So there have been a number of different documents that have come out subsequent to this, and Chip has spent some time talking about them, but I'm going to mention a couple of them. Uh, and uh, so let's see, I want to start off with the ISTE standards that came out this year. This is kind of an upgrade uh, to the standards uh, for teacher education. And uh, they really highlight things like the use of digital tools to maximize active deep learning, the creation of innovative digital learning environments to engage and support learning. It really synchronizes very nicely with the position statement that we have. And the Early Childhood Working Group, of which Chip, my old friend Leona Schabel, <coughs> and other important STEM specialists were a part, put together a very important document that thir further clarifies the unique positionality of technology as a classification of man-made tools to empower learners and creators. So the position statement now, a worldly five-year-old, heads off to, of course, kindergarten. Uh, and this timing corresponds to the release of this book by Mitch Resnick of I, uh, of MIT entitled Lifelong Kindergarten. And in the book, Mitch talks about creative learning, that it's the hallmark of kindergarten play and addresses how we might cultivate the same creative ethic in children of all ages and backgrounds. Through our approach, he characterizes in four words, projects, passion, peers, and play. And this is in part an alliterative homage to the visionary principles of Seymour Pepper. And for those of you who may not know, uh, MIT's Media Lab Lifelong Kindergarten Group is actually hosting an open sort of book read-along um, that is characterized as kind of part course, part learning community. Um, and they're only part way through it. So I would encourage you if, you, if you can, to snap up that book and do a read-along post to be part of the community. It's really a fascinating opportunity to use technology for your own professional development and uh, to form that community. So playful use of technology should embody the principles contained in the position statement exemplified in these many books and statements that have followed and so adaptly um, uh, described in Resnick's book. <coughs> the key to the use of these digital tools is the same as it has been with all manipulatives, that is intentionality. As Chip noted on his return from Russia, it starts with pedagogy. Educators must be considering what materials and approach will fit particular learning situations. Next is uh, uh, Lisa Gurney's three C's. Any use of digital media should always take into account the child, their needs and capabilities, the uh, nature of the learning materials that are going to be explored and in the form of content, and being aware of what the learning situation calls for, that context. Uh, with the notion of encouraging interactivity in situations that empower children to be creators of their own content. 
uh, options, open-ended choices, allowing active, engaging, purposeful opportunities, fostering collaborative co-engagement that would make Vygotsky proud. Um, and playful technology use should always support and not supplant other essential learning activities. So here's my framing challenge. Listen closely to what your children seem to need. Listen to their words, to their body language, to their art, to their play, to their questions, all of which will tell you about themselves and then intentionally select those materials that can empower their learning, encouraging them to delve deeply into what they are exploring. And as I say every year at this conference, it's not the technology. It's not just that technology. It's how you use it. So I was shocked the other morning to wake up and discover this is my fifth decade as an educator. I was remembering yesterday um, with Chip that uh, we had met 30 years ago um, and right at the cusp of this revolution, but not much has changed in the past 30 years. That was a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> Currently, I direct uh, a child learning and development center at Pacific University where I founded uh, a learning community. At the early learning community, I have the pleasure of working with an outstanding team of educators and 80 preschool through second graders uh, from whom I learn every day and virtually all that I will share with you today in the form of pictures or examples comes from the wonderful work being done in the ELC. And so, I encourage you to venture to the wet and wild wilderness in the west that is Oregon, and if you do, come visit. For the next one. We'd like to register a complaint. We can't use those kind of words, and uh, you're making us look a little bit less diminutive. I'll, so could I'll, you dumb it down? I will try. A tiny bit? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yuppers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> For the next 10 minutes or so, I'll show you relatively few new tools um, and provide some context and analysis uh, regarding their use in early childhood classrooms. Uh, a little speech to text, some coding, flat panel digital microscope in the form of a case study and inquiry project that, um, that I'll be sharing with you. But let me start with this. I hope you can see and hear this. The wind howled in a house. Everyone was having dinner. Can you hear me? We heard a monster shriek. It's a busy classroom. Someone went outside to check it out, but they never came back. Someone else went outside. They heard something that couldn't be explained. She's just making this up because she was A monster rose out of the darkness and grabbed him too. And they were never heard from again until one day. A moonlit night. They rose from the dark as monsters. And when they arose, and when they rose, they were all ready to go. So every time you hear the cheek. Don't go outside. Okay, so I've stayed inside since then. Um, this is Beatrice, um, and she's a storyteller, um, but she's not a story writer. She does not like to pick up that pencil. Her head moves faster, and her mouth moves faster than her hand can, and so. Um, let me introduce you to a 10-year quest of mine, and that has been speech-to-text. Um, 
I've been looking for the refinement of a tool that can assist children in what I think will be a revolutionary ways. When children can speak words and see them appear on the screen, how might this emergent understanding of literacy evolve? Think of the possibilities. Writing for young children can have a physical as well as a working memory limitation in their ability to write. So they can't keep up and they can't keep it. What was it I was thinking? Oh, I can't remember. Um, their hands can't move as fast as their imaginations. By the time they write a few words, they've forgotten how it ends. This year with some experimentation, I have come to believe that a program developed over the years by Google is really now ready. So I'm working with some five and six-year-olds. That was a six-year-old. Let me play you with the story of a five-year-old. He was six. Once upon a time, there was a girl um, who was going to have a baby. She was so excited to see if it was a boy or a girl. She was hoping for a girl. But then the baby was born and and she was so disappointed that the baby was a boy, that, but she liked it a lot, the end. Yep. That is a kindergarten story, is it not? Um, and you can see, it's a busy classroom, lots of things going on, and this program picked up 90-some percent of all the words that were spoken and turned them into text. It's been fascinating, um, and I'll continue to work with this, but um, it looks <coughs> like we may have found, finally, this tool that will uh, allow this capacity, and I want to share some of the ideas. Imagine someone who can uh, speak a story, then print it out, and then maybe an ad, add an illustration or put it onto a digital device, or um, how important this could be for, uh, for folks who have disabilities, um, for whom maybe small motor control doesn't really work, or they need some other kind of assistive device. Again, I am encouraging this as a support for the writing process, not to supplant the importance of actually writing yourself when possible. So let me pivot now to an interesting new form of literacy. Maybe. A fundamental process of the of becoming literate is to become familiar with symbols, how they fit together the conventions of grammar. With textual literacy, we work with children to learn the letters, what they represent, how to organize them, how to organize the words into meaningful sentences. With coding literacy, we work with children to learn the actions and what they represent, how to organize them into meaningful blocks, and how to organize the blocks into meaningful action sequences. I have set, found that for some children and even adults, the abstraction of coding as a sequence language is a bridge. If not too far, it's certainly uncomfortable as a stretch. And so I've been thinking, what would Piaget say? One of Piaget's basic tenets was the movement from the concrete to the abstract from the physically manipulative to the mentally manipulative. Utilizing this idea in classrooms by starting with recognizable and manipulative materials and allowing children to interact with them before moving to the more mental or abstracted manipulations of concepts generally facilitates <coughs> learning. And while I think this is the idea behind many of the devices that Papert and Resnick and Marina Fears and others have developed to bring coding to life, in my classrooms, it has not always worked. So I've been working to find some scaffolds. What are some pre-coding? What are some precursor and some concrete activities um, that might be useful? So here's one we've been playing around with. Robot turtles. It's a board game. Yes, of course, the name itself is an homage. Um, it's a collaborative, not competitive game that turns code into movements on the game good at scaffolding and, be, uh, and developing the shared understanding of coding. Um, it's simple and effective in getting across the ideas, um, 
but it, it hasn't been as powerful as it might be. And, and honestly, I really love the approach used by uh, Deanna McLennan uh, as she wrote about it in the March issue of Teaching Young Children. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that, uh, drawing on the floor, creating grids, and uh, having a number of other ways of um, using manipulative materials uh, that, that children code the action for. So I'll be trying that next myself. We have an iPad game known as Move the Turtle, and we'll ask and see if Warren has that on his fancy new iPad. Um, that's right, um, by the time we get there. It's a simple coding app. It's easy to use, works on principles that would make Seymour proud. You, you know, select uh, the particular tool you need, you drag it in there, you apply the code, and activate it, and Yay, I'm a winner. <laughs> so, it's a basic activity. It hasn't really inspired the children yet. The good people at Osmo have developed a wonderful interface that combines physicality with virtuality in a fun and engaging set of iPad apps. If you don't know the Osmo apps, I've been presenting about them over the years, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Manipulative materials in front of a, an iPad, it pulls those uh, images into the iPad, and then you can man manipulate them. So we've been trying out the Osmo coding game for the past year. It involves those chips that you move into place. Um, it's an adventure game. Um, it has some open-ended activities, but mostly it solved the problem. Get, you know, your creature uh, down to the end. Um, as with all of these games, and, and it's the rule of thirds, make sure that there's room for one person and another person and a third person to perch over. There's always people clustered around working together on these tools. Um, but um, I did pull uh, someone aside and asked him to uh, show us how this works. So Henry, take it away. Go up one, make a jump this way, and then we're gonna go forward. What are you doing with the glitter? One, then go over. So that's kind of fun. Your basic principles of coding manifest in an action game designed to solve problems. Um, so the chips that are used seem to uh, allow the children enough sort of concrete manipulativeness that they recognize that the, what they're doing with their hands affects the game, but it's not quite as concrete as it might be, and not everyone gets the idea. And so um, I had this thought, what if I could take those small pieces and turn them into very large pieces? So that you could take these, put them together, lay them out on the floor, and code your friends. <laughs> and code your teacher. So uh, yes, I offered myself up as the first Cody, um, and they were excited to see me hop across the floor. They said, can we put the number two and five together to make 25 jumps, Mr. Mark? <laughs> I said no. Um, <laughs> Um, and so this is, um, has worked really well. They're just giant copies with movable dials and they rotate just really nicely. This was a whole weekend of laminating and, um, and cutting out, you know, the life of a teacher. Um, and um, the, what was really fun was that back to school night when parents came, code your parents. Oh my gosh, the parents not only didn't really quite understand it, but they were willing victims and the children had great glee in being able to have them jump, hop, and walk around the room. So here's Georgia doing, uh, and notice how she has to think about this. I recognize that classroom is really loud, so I'll have to get everyone to pipe down next time. 
this summer, Osmo came out with a new game called Coding Jam, and I was uh, quite excited about it. Um, uh, it utilizes the same principles, actually most of those same movable chips, um, and it allows the creation of musical sequences of pre-programmed musical phrases. And so it kind of starts like this. Uh, on the left is one sequence. And then there's a second sequence. You pick a second character. And the character embodies a certain musical genre. You can pick from multiple. And then you put them together in this piece of music that then you perform. So it's fun and engaging, but there's something missing to me. It seems kind of like coding light, but I've just begun to play with it a little bit. It's new this year. Um, and so I'll, I'll play more fully with it and report back to you next year. But um, it seems to me that there's, there's something about it that's a little commercial. I also don't like the idea of having winners, community winners, and thereby some who are not winners. Um, but um, it's an interesting interface and a different way to think about coding. So to coding itself, um, there's a variety of languages, hopscotch, um, and Scratch, Swift, Scratch Junior, and we've been trying all of them in the classroom because I've been trying to explore what this new kind of lexicon um, could provide to students. So here's Hopscotch, runs on an iPad and iPhone. It's a vertical code, very similar to, um, to Scratch, and it's drag and drop little components. And it seems easy to use, not very exciting uh, for the kids. It's very similar in some respects to, um, to Scratch. This is uh, um, Resnick's uh, lab's visual language, um, and it runs on iPads and computers. Um, there's a number of workshops. I went a couple of weekends ago to a Harvard sort of meet up and code thing that, uh, that they're holding throughout the, the country. Um, um, did a little bit of coding with Scratch, and it was really fun to connect it to servos and other movable objects as a static piece on an iPad, it's not as inspirational uh, to kids yet. And I think part of that is because they're surrounded by all of the electronics and wonderful animatronics, some of which Warren will, will show you today, um, that are visually and affectively engaging. And so it, it's sometimes hard to get past that. Uh, there's Scratch Junior, uh, kind of a more entry level uh, piece where again you drag the chips in to, into place and it allows your cat to move along and yay! find it itself in a crater. Um, uh, Swift Playground. Uh, how many of you have, have tried Swift at all, or Swift Playground? It's really interesting. It's Apple's new coding language. The playground itself is wicked cool. Um, you know, the, the few scenarios you can walk through, and I'll, I'll have uh, Layla here do a, a quick demonstration. Watch up in the right corner, and I'll zoom in a little bit here. There's a little creature. She programs the code, walks down, goes to a transporter where it disappears, and pop comes back up. And then turns, goes over, reaches up, and grabs the gem. How did that work? And she's enthralled. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, there's something here that my students, the students in this classroom, haven't quite gotten yet. And I think part of it is they're waiting for this. They're waiting for Kibo or, or Finch or the Mbot. They're waiting for some physical manifestation. Um, so in fact, um, I have 15 of these Mindstorms kits um, that I got from uh, the physics lab. Um, and uh, at some point, what we'll be doing is uh, taking their Lego fascination and, um, and building them into movable bots. And we'll see if, um, if that might change um, their, uh, their engagement with things. But um, so I do believe uh, that coding, as it stays on this iPad or computer, is is there's something there that's hard to compete with some of the exciting other apps that are around. So it will be interesting to see its evolution. I think as a language it's really powerful. As a, uh, a bit to control things, I tried moving it to the concrete and, and that has helped some because now students own in their bodies what this coding means. I think now the next step is to, to move it to allow other motionable bodies to move and that's, that's possibly where it will be fascinating. 
So what I want to do with the, uh, the remainder of the presentation I have is um, what Chip noted yesterday was the Vygotskyan entry, lead with your pedagogy rather than tools. And so while there are um, supporting roles played in the classroom and in the story that I'm going to tell you in part by um, a uh, white uh, smart panel and a digital microscope, let me just take a moment to, to talk about those two. I believe that digital microscopes are the quintessential early childhood tool. This is it right here, plugs into USB, or it also, um, there are wireless. Um, it's not that cheap, but it is used for everything in the classroom by kids. For anything STEM -y science, this is an amazing and powerful tool for everyone from graduate students, my mother, all the way down to um, three-year-olds. Where do you get them? Because I was trying to find them downstairs. Um, they, they are made by, the good ones are made by ProScope. Yeah. I do not own any stock in the company. It is from <laughs> Oregon, as are all good things. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, but it's, a, it's amazing, and there's about six different varieties. There's one now um, that's about $125 that, that plugs in. It's not quite as portable as this, but it's great. The resolution is good. It's amazing. When plugged into a smart board, it can do uh, uh, wonderful things. And smart boards, you're probably familiar with. It's that white thing that looks like people want to write on it with a marker and has a projector. Not anymore. Um, the smart boards that we use at our school are interactive 4K flat panel monitors that are awesome. Multi-touch, up to eight touches at once. You can move things around. They do all the things that the software will do. Crisp, they're really great for viewing when we were watching an eagle hatch this year from eggs and uh, uh, displaying the pictures that children had brought from home or um, you know things from the blog. It's really a, uh, an amazing tool. So. This is a um, this is my school and classroom, and let me start off um, by uh, <coughs> saying it's imperative that we remember that it's never been about the seductive new tool, but the high quality teaching that makes the difference. Um, and so, um, listen to children, use their uh, empowering technologies in the classroom, encourage and support deep explorations. That's what teaching is is really about. And I want to start off this story by having Dylan explain what happened. I was just sitting, listening along, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black thing moving toward the carpet. Nobody really knows where it came from. Although I didn't want to shout it out, and then I just raised my hand and said, what's that black thing doing on the floor? That's known as a student-generated provocation. <coughs> Uh, so then immediately questions came up, and that was, let's see, is it dangerous? What characteristics does it have? What type of bug is it? Pretty obvious, it's uh, one of those things that eats wood. A termite? Yeah, termite, that's what it is. So um, we move from listening to, and then by the way, when that happens, everything else in the classroom stops, and you can say, pay no attention to that bug. Look over here at the, mm, we know how that works. It's like bug is curriculum now for the rest of the day. So um, empower the children. We pulled up the smart board. The teacher said, um, actually someone said, run and go get Mr. Mark. Um, so I came in and started documenting. And, uh, and so they pulled up on the smart board. Um, what do you think it is? And well, maybe it's a um, termite. I don't know, maybe it looks kind of like a king termite. Okay, and so we got our digital cameras. We started using digital cameras to take photographs of it so that we could really document, zoom in, get a little bit closer. Um, we pulled out the digital microscope to make even closer um, observations. Um, and we began to do this in groups. What does the digital microscope reveal? The teacher the next morning, this took place over the course of about six days. The teacher pulled out a provocation. Look closely at the pictures we saw yesterday. What do you notice? What kind of insects do you think it is? Why do you think it's that insect? Uh, and so um, we pulled out the proscope, and this is what the proscope will do for you. Yes. Notice the compound eyes, the mandibles, the palpi, the antenna. Take a look at the level of detail that you're able to get. And this is in a low resolution projector. You should see it on a smart board. It's hyper real. Um, this is its back and neck. Um, that's just amazing. 
uh, the detail that you can get. And kids began to be scientific about looking at their antenna, examining their leg, looking at the abdomen where it joins to the tail and starting to say, okay, uh, where are its wings? Can't be an insect, doesn't have any wings. And this began a really complex investigation. So they went to the, back to the smart board, we started pulling up bugs, looking at a variety of bugs, talking about things. Dylan looks at its tail down there at the bottom says, yeah, I don't think it's a termite. It doesn't have the right uh, end to the tail. So now we start printing out these photographs, pulling out books and pamphlets, and, um, and really trying to find all the media we can to explore this. Um, I printed out 10 ways to identify an insect, um, which is partly a guide that was on the web and that I also altered to make useful. Here's how this was. Okay. Okay. Do you see a pair of antennas? Yeah, he's excited. Yeah, there are antennas. You bet. Um, and so we went through and It was a community event. As people would explore, they would bring their friends over. And here's Layla who comes over to see what he's got. Listen to Layla closely. His wings. No. I that out to help you if you need to. No. Wait. The blood. See? We'll show you the blood. Every that's good at you. If you can see their the top of the looks like he has invisible wings. Or might be the air Let's take a bit of a Maybe Layla's right. Maybe Layla's right. Maybe Layla's right. Maybe Layla's right. Let's explore some more. So on the other side, we'll say if we go closer into it. We get a sense for how sharp that is. It looks like it's too big of something. Yeah, that that looks like the same thing, but that's with red eyes. So we came up with this uh, place to chart the investigation. Um, pictures of what I have, obser uh, have observed, here's what I've noticed, here's what I'm wondering, here's what I think, a way to chart this progress. And we're sitting there and we're talking about it. This has little pictures and pictures, but this is exactly what it looks like. What is that creature you have there? Aha, it might be a beetle. Well, let's test that hypothesis. More investigating is being done. No, it's not. It's not. Guys, so, look. Those have those on it. And when you look closer to it, it doesn't have um, ears. Um, it's not an earwig. <laughs> but what about its lack of wings? So people are documenting their... A little outer shell um, that is protecting them. And when he's ready to fly, he, he lifts up the outer shell, that outer shell and his wings come out. Uh, another student talked about the way a, um, a ladybug, you don't really see its wings, but if you lift them up as they lift them up. And so... Um, one further conversation here. Yeah, it's real big. And it has the muscles like that, and they both have a lot. And this, and it has little hairs just like this one. So it's a rose beetle. Also, it has the pattern. It has the antenna pattern. I got it. So it's a rose beetle. What do I? No excitement there. This is after a week of deeply studying this. Let's let her conclude for us. I looked at it through the microscope and um, I and 
then I looked it at the book and it looked it exactly the same because under the microscope I could see like the little hooks that keep the wing help the so are part of the wing and um under the microscope I also saw um it has like little scales that go around and the book also had that too. Yeah, and um the and the row beetle um it had the same pattern on the antennas. So the last thing we did was after discovering it was a rove beetle and recognizing that they took care of uh, uh, creatures, insects that were in the garden, we took it outside and released it into our garden so that it could take care of some of the garden pests that were out there. It's never been about the seductive new tool, but high quality teaching that makes a difference. In the example we just saw, students primarily used a microscope attached to an older laptop and a smart board. However, guided thoughtfully by a master teacher, they read, observed, wrote, drew, and hypothesized. As a community, they collaborated, compared, analyzed, discussed, and listened to each other. Sometimes they disagreed. They exercised multiple lines of media literacy. They explored issues of science, technology, engineering, and even mathematics. In the end, this was a project they were all passionate about that built relationships between peers, and through it all, it embodied the spirit of child-initiated, child-directed, teacher-supported play. It was facilitated by a teacher who listened, who provided empowering tools and support, and enabled the students to go deep into their quest for understanding. So, Here's my challenge to you. Learn about all manner of digital tools. Carefully assess their quality and pedagogical applicability so that when relevant, you can use them intentionally. But do not privilege them. It's not the technology. It's how you use it. Thank you. Uh, quite while we're sw swapping out, yeah. yes. Um, I purchased the ProScope last name that you were here. Uh oh. Loved it, loved it. But um, make sure you guys buy the lens when you buy the body. <laughs> good, good <laughs> suggestion. How close was your magnification on that? Because you were like. That's that's 50 power. Um, that's that the standard 50? what it comes out with 50 really? power. And the kids get really good at learning how to use yeah. that. So, wow. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, but you can oh, use your phone, right? Yeah. Yes. You were saying that um, you thought there was something missing from the games on the screen, that they're not as engaging as they could be. Well, why do you think uh, that child Henry wanted to do coding to activate the action game? Like, what motivates them to do it? Did you say, okay, here's something you could try? You know, that's a great question, and, and, and it's not just Henry. There's a group of about six intense coders who collaborate around, and then another group that is really not so interested. Um, and some of it might be developmental. I have a first and second blend, and many of them are second graders who are a little bit um, more mature. But some of them are first graders as well, so it's not just, <coughs> excuse me, their age. That is a question that I am asking myself. I am in the process of doing an inquiry project to investigate why that is and what I can do to, to support them. I really don't have a good answer for you. Um, I, my working hypothesis is that there's something more captivatingly engaging about the other games that draws people to do other things with the, the iPads. But Henry loves it. Uh, there's a, about five or six other kids who really enjoy allowing things, and they're working together to get to the next level, to get all the pieces they can, to get the points they want. But um, related to gambling in any way? <laughs> it, that's 
that's a, I mean, I view that really as a legitimate question with, a gr with an answer that um, I would have to say in some respects, the idea of continual reinforcement brings people back to, for more. Um, and so it very well could be. I, I don't have a good answer and that's a great en question. Engagement is, can take many forms. Diane? All right, thank you. <laughs> Ooh, that was a segue. That was an interesting, yeah. very interesting segue. Yes. So I'm going to take us for the next couple minutes in a slightly different direction. My name is Diane Bales. I am a faculty member um, and extension specialist at the University of Georgia. And in the last year, I have also taken on another uh, job responsibility that I'm going to tell you a little bit about and have been taking my knowledge and experience with technology at ECE uh, and trying to make sense of how that fits into this, into this uh, new world. So just very quickly, my background in terms of uh, technology and ECE. Yes, yeah, so the microphone will probably be. <coughs> um, I have spent I have spent a number of years collaborating with uh, an experienced preschool teacher at our child development lab on campus, uh, doing various kinds of projects. We've tried. We've done coding. We've done microscopes. We've done, We've used various tools um, to really try to um, use technology to help children solve their own problems and answer their own questions. And so, of course, I learned a whole lot from this collaboration, from the discussions um, with him and the observations of the children and all of those kinds of things. Um, so as I have stepped into this new position that is, a, it's only one part of my job, it's a, an add-on because I needed a few more jobs. Um, but as I've stepped into this, I've been able to take a lot of what I've learned from the classroom to this world of child life. Have any of you heard of child life besides Chip? Oh, great. I, I, more than I expected. Uh, for those of you who don't know the child life field, uh, child life specialists are child development experts who work with children in healthcare settings to deal with their social emotional needs around um, illness, chronic illness, uh, acute illness, hospitalization, those kinds of things. So imagine a person who helps you as a child to figure out how to cope with being scared because you're going to get an immunization. Or who explains to you, someone just told you you had diabetes and they explain to you in uh, five-year-old appropriate language what diabetes is and what that's going to mean for you. That's basically, a child life specialists do a lot of different things within that general realm. Um, they are play-based, they're working from developmentally appropriate practice, from under deep understanding of child development, mostly around issues related to coping skills in, in hospital healthcare settings, pain management, non-pharmacological pain management, so ways to manage your pain uh, in addition to medications that they're not going to be able to prescribe. Uh, and then educating children around diagnoses and procedures and those kinds of things. So this is a world that's also very heavily inhabited in the last several years by technology. Um, as you can imagine, hospitals are very tech savvy as a, as a general rule, and technology companies have seen the work of child life and seen lots of opportunities to bring technology into this world. So you see lots of uh, you see lots of different kinds of activities and strategies used, used including technology, for to reach to meet these kinds of goals and do these kinds of activities. A lot of a lot of what happens in a hospital, particularly for longer term patients, is what they call normalization and or developmental stimulation. Basically giving children opportunities to play, to do as much as possible the kinds of activities they would be doing if they were not in the hospital. Um, communicating with families and friends, distracting children during procedures, alleviating boredom is sometimes uh, a, a genuine goal. Uh, educating children about diagnoses, pre preparing for procedures, in addition to coping with uh, stress, coping with pain, those kinds of things. So there are issues that come up related to technology that are both similar and different to the issues in the early care and education uh, world. And I've discovered some distinct uh, kind of schools of thought in the same way that I, we have seen these in ECE over the years. There is a group of child life specialists who are the no screen time people. Uh, you know, they, we remember this from hopefully, um, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, session, sure, exactly. I'm going to say hopefully the past, but it's not. It's not always the case. Um, and they believe that there are other tools and other strategies that 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 can be used and should be used. 
I would say all of us up here and probably most of you in the audience would agree that technology, is, or should it, hopefully should agree, that technology is not the only tool. Um, there are there is a subset of child life specialists who are using technology primarily as a preparation and distraction tool. These are typically the folks in the acute care units. They're in the emergency department. They are maybe in the ICU. Um, they're pre-surgery. Those kind those kinds of things where they're uh, using it as a teaching tool and or a distraction tool. And Chip and I were talking for just a second before uh, this started because I knew that I know that he has a little bit of connection with uh, what's going on in child life as well and as an early childhood educator I had to get over my reaction to the word distraction because that's something that we sort we are sort of brought up and educated to think of as a bad thing in the world of the hospital it's not always a bad thing if you're having an awful cut stitched up on your arm then it, distraction may be exactly what it what you need so, and then there's another subset of child life specialists who are using it more uh, to integrate for integrated and deep kinds of learning. And those are more often the folks in the more chronic care units, the ones who have patients for many days, many weeks, many months sometimes. So, and there are lots of innovative uses. I want to very quickly show you just a couple of them um, that I've become familiar with. Um, there's an app called Simply Say It, which is uh, child life specialists uh, use quite regularly. It was developed by Phoenix Children's Hospital. It has medical definitions, both of body parts, uh, diagnoses, conditions, and also technolo the technology and the equipment that they're likely to be used. So it's empowering children with information. And I've got a quick screenshot here. These are two different images. Um, that, that kind of give you an idea. The one on the right gives you, uh, uh, shows you the page on magnetic re resonance imaging. So it's a quick, child-friendly kind of explanation of what an MRI is, along with a picture, and there are several other pictures you can scroll through, so you can see and be less intimidated by this uh, machine. So they've had a lot of success with this app. Um, it is probably geared toward late, late preschool, kindergarten, first, second, third, or even a little bit later elementary. It's not the kind of tool you're going to use very successfully with a lot of three and four year olds without a lot of additional explanation. Another, te another technology that uh, is getting used more and more is using robots uh, to connect children who are not able to be in the classroom to uh, their classroom uh, experiences and opportunities. So uh, it's an opportunity to maintain connection with what's going on in the school classroom, uh, either ECE or elementary school, a chance to connect with friends. The challenge is how to, how to create a deep and meaningful learning experience when the child is not physically present and physically able to do the things that the classmates are doing. So. These are a couple of photos of the devices that are typically used, um, pulled from some news stories. Um, the one with the oval around it, I, I drew the oval because I wasn't sure you'd be able to pick that out of the background of the story, but it's basically a uh, digital device on a uh, pole that is mobile, and the child who is in the hospital or at home can control it with an iPad and uh, move it around. They can speak, they can see the, the uh, classroom, the classroom can see them, and so it's um, intended to be an opportunity for children to engage. Obviously, there are limitations. You're not going to be able to add to the block structure from the other side of the iPad, but it's, you know, it's a beginning uh, opportunity to try and keep children connected. There's another tool that I'm uh, really interested in from this field uh, that's been in development for the last couple of years called Distraction in Action. What I love about this, this is a great tool that, that, that in some ways empowers both children and parents. In a, uh, usually this is used for children who are going into some sort of a medical procedure. It might be as simple as something like stitches, it might be surgery, it might be a, a spinal tap, something more complicated and that uh, takes a little longer. But it's the goal is to reduce pain by distracting the child during the procedure, but it creates a customized plan led by the parent and the child together. Uh, and so a professional can help the family use it or the family can use it either before or during the time in the hospital. So I, again, I pulled a couple of examples. This is one page of a couple of parent questions. So it's asking, how does your child typically cope with pain? Are they silent? Are they are loud and emotional? 
How does the child's mother cope with pain? Are they silent? Are they loud and emotional? How does the child's father cope with pain? Are they silent? Are they loud and emotional? And that's that's not a, the mother father thing. Of course, is not acknowledging the diversity of family types, but it's a start, I suppose. Um, for the child, they're asking more child-friendly kinds of questions. And the child, if they can read, are old enough to read, can read and answer them. More often, an adult is reading them and, and, um, and um, helping them answer the question. So let's pretend you fell and scraped your knee. Your mom or dad's going to wash it off and put a Band-Aid on it. What would you rather do? Would you rather watch your mom or dad wash it off? There are some kids who want to be involved. They want a job. They want to know exactly what's happening. Others. Uh, would rather look away and think of something else and not pay any attention. So those are the ones who need the most distraction. And then how much worry or stress are you having right now? And so the child can kind of say, I've got lots and lots and lots, or I don't have very much. And so it creates a profile. So this was, this was my example profile for my 10-year-old nephew that I created just to test this out. He was not very stressed by whatever my imaginary situation was. Uh, but what it does is it creates some customized ideas of what you can do for him. I, I, I talked about him as one who would want to be distracted, not watch and participate. And so these were some, some customized kinds of ideas. So that's another example. And then one more example, and I'm hoping to uh, get to explore this more hands-on in the next year or so, is uh, using virtual reality technology. Uh, sometimes it's used to familiarize children with operating rooms, uh, equipment, those kinds of things. Other times it's used uh, for distraction, and a lot of times for self-esteem and control. One thing children in the hospital don't have is much control over their world. And so being uh, able to participate in VR uh, is one way they can do something that they have control over. It's also, mo uh, a lot, in a lot, of a lot of cases, portable enough that it can be brought to a child's room, used bedside, they don't have to get up and go someplace else to do it. And so here's one quick, just one quick, uh, just a photo, but this was a um, collaboration between the company, um, 900 Pounds of Creative, and uh, Cook Children's Hospital in Fort Worth, where they brought in uh, VR for children. This, in this case, this boy was playing a basketball game, so using this as a distraction and mastery kind of thing. So there are lots and lots of other possibilities. Um, I do want to uh, point out that there is both potential and challenges, just as there are in ECE um, classrooms and groups. Um, the biggest challenges, um, health issues complicate the use of technology for a lot of children. The biggest first and foremost question child life specialists will ask you is, how can I disinfect this technology when a child's done with it? Because that is the biggest hospital concern. So, you know, so, so there are other issues that have to um, come in and be discussed. <coughs> Again, like in every other use of technology, the key is intentionality. It's not pulling out the iPad because it's cool, it's slick, it's fun, you can play a game, kids like it. It's pulling out the iPad because you know that this child needs this experience to help with this social emotional need in this situation. And so that's just kind of a quick tour of, of some connections of how uh, technology is being used uh, outside. If anybody has an interest in this, I would love to talk more with you because I'm trying to sort of build my community as I get into this, uh, this area. And I'm going to pass it on to Bonnie so that she has some time to share. We're zooming. We are. Um, I'm my daughter was two years old and she had an anesthesia device so that while she was getting up, going to go get the medicine and just begin to fall asleep that she was just watching it and it uh -huh. mommy calm because I knew she was calm. You knew she was okay. It helps leave. parents as much as yeah. it does as much as it does the children because you can be calm because you know she's okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Bye. Okay. Let's roll. Um, what I'd like to talk today is um, I pick a couple of areas. Yesterday I talked a little bit about digital storytelling. I love to work with practitioners. I live and work in Maine. And today I want to talk about thinking about technology to communicate, build community, and get creative. What are communication preferences for families? I know that uh, Chip had a book he edited on family engagement. One of the challenges is how can we move from not only in, um, forming families but actually inviting them to be involved with their child's learning. You know, what do families prefer? Do they want print-based newsletter and tip sheets or digital communication systems? And um, if it is digital, what kind of messages can not only 
inform them, but really invite them to get involved. So we've been trying to explore that. Um, one of the apps that we use frequently is um, Seesaw in some of these different programs. And in this case, uh, the little girl is taking a photo of an observational drawing, and that is sent along with her dictation um, to her parent, and the parent replies. In this instance, so you know, what are some of the different ways that we actually, what kind of things are families interested in hearing about from the classroom? This teacher said this has been a game changer for her with her families because all of a sudden they really know what's going on in the classroom. Um, everyone has different realities, as Diane just mentioned. In this classroom, they're doing the OWL curriculum. So they are very busy all day long with a lot of kind of scripted activities, including um, you know, colors and, and different subjects. But this teacher is really interested in science. She noticed that the children didn't understand the uh, sink and float center. And so she took time, and this is not a heavily resourced program. You know, one teacher, morning class, afternoon class, she's on her own with eight children. And she set up the iPad or used it and, and walked each child through explaining to them using you know, scientific type language how you would do that activity and shared that with the families of their own child along with a Sesame Street online experiment which was a video simulation and invited families to do that with them, you know, with the children at home where they could choose something and predict whether it sinks or floats and there was a hypothesis. So it's not a video, it's actually a simulation. And um, the response was that the families really liked that, and now they were trying to do sink or float activities at home because they had some additional scaffolding. And this is one of the, um, the, the videos. Oh, wait, hold on, tell me, what is that? A rock. It's a rock. Tell me what you just said. It's heavy. It's what are some other things thing you observe about it? It's like thing it's from your sink. Oh. oh, oh my goodness, your hypothesis was correct. So where is it going to go? And this sink box. All right, let's try one more. Okay, I think you get the idea. So there are a lot of different communication um, systems, and actually, NYC has a new Hello discussion forum, and that was a topic that came up recently. And there were many systems that I had never even heard of. Um, I know another one that's been used around Maine is Remind. But what do the different systems offer? Sometimes they offer text, photos, video, audio. What about translation support? In one of the programs in Maine, you know, a lot of the families speak Spanish at home. And this has provided, you know, really connection where there really wasn't an opportunity before. Um, can you send individual messages, group messages? And in some cases, you could organize things into portfolios. And, uh, you know, does it have a cost or is it free? And is there online PD about how to use the resource? In this case, in that classroom that was studying colors, um, they created a, a book, which we talked about yesterday, an I Spy Colors book, by looking at things in the classroom. And to support that, that book that they created, the digital book, was sent home um, so that the families could enjoy it. And we, they realized, the teacher realized, that the children really struggled to, to have descriptive words. You know, I spy with my little eye. Uh, you know, what is that? You know, how do I describe that? Lucky if we got color or any kind of shape. And so they, again, found a, a short, you know, these short clips, you know, two minutes, nothing really long, of playing I spy at the grocery store. And they shared that, you know, through the Seesaw platform. It's very easy to do. Um, you know, we're playing I Spy at school, and here's where you can do that when you go grocery shopping. And um, the one parent wrote back, we watched the video last night, and now that's all she wants to do, play I Spy, which, of course, is going to help with oral language development. Um, in this classroom, they have a different, they don't have the constraint or the system where they have an OWL programming to do all day long and could get a little bit more involved in one of the nature studies they did around flowers. Um, they also incorporated the use of QR codes. Um, so this little child is using the scanner um, to scan and see a, a time-lapse video of a flower blooming and inform some of that. And also using the proscope, realizing you don't have to pull the flowers apart, but you can look more deeply inside. But the, the um, link to the time-lapse and what they were doing about the flowers could also be shared at home so that families could, could look at that together with their children. When the vet came to visit, that was another um, way that this app could be used to share. Um, there were some clips of the vet talking. Uh, the vet had the children look at some of the different x-rays that he brought and kind of guess what happened, what animal was going on. And the teacher shared that provocation and said, you know, here's one of the x-rays that the vet shared with us. What do you think is going on here? And you can see a parent comment, I love this app. Are they bullets? You know, there was conversation around what would actually happen and they could look at that with their child. 
Daphne, what do you think that dog ate? A bullet. A bullet? We'll see if you're right. And they, the replies in that case cannot, you know, you can, parents can put print or do an audio reply with Seesaw. Sometimes the invitations were playful. They used a proscope to see what we were eating at snack and invited the parents to see if they could guess which snack that they had sent in. Anyone want to guess what this one is? Cheerios. It's a raspberry. It's a berry. Oh, <laughs> and huh. the families had fun and the children were laughing, <laughs> you know, what they thought it was and what they thought their snack was. So um, sometimes uh, you can share about apps. It's like a jungle out there. Families want to know what's going to be useful. And in this case, the child was learning how chatter picks works, <coughs> and the teacher just introduced instruments into the classroom. And um, she decided to take a picture with, uh, of the instrument and then use chatter picks to draw a mouth and then sing Twinkle Star and make the instrument sing while she was playing the instrument. So she was exploring that instrument and using some digital tools as well. Um, yesterday I showed a little bit about, like also with chatter picks, um, the zombie, which was uh, using Play-Doh, and the child made a mouth, and you said, oh, zombie story, and he said, I love you, Mrs. Wooster, you know, he's just heartfelt, loves his teacher, so that was the zombie story, you know, you don't know if you don't ask, and when you do the digital recording, you can more easily share some of that. Um, app recommendations, therefore, can be shared with families, the program with the, the uh, you know, showing the instrument, that that program, the families come in to pick their children up, and when they saw all this being demonstrated, they said, oh, what happened to that? And so it's very easy, and family, families sometimes really appreciate, if you have taken time to curate and find some really good apps, they are really, really wanting to know oftentimes what they can use at home. So you can share those recommendations with them. The other one was uh, one they had used in one of the classes for um, forming letters. Oh, I am an information lover, so we're switching from family engagement to, you know, where can we find some little nuggets of information, stay current. I'm not a big Twitter user, but um, I've been enjoying some of the work Kate Harriman's been putting out lately about making integrate with STEM. She has a book, she has a webinar, and I, you know, every now and then I go and look at Twitter, and I notice that little maze up in the corner on the top there. A five-year-old loved tinkering for hours, building this hex bug maze, and continues to iterate. So I thought, oh, you know, I work with programs, and they just don't have huge budgets. So I'm thinking, cardboard. You know, I love things with recycled materials. And so um, I got a hex bug at Toys R Us for six dollars, and it was. I only heard about this a couple of weeks ago. So I have a, some friends who have a four-year-old uh, boy and a six-year-old girl. So I went over to try it out. And so they immediately named the, uh, the hex bug buddy, and they decided that the tissue box was going to be the home. But to get into the home, well, you, you needed to do something because it was not flush to the ground. So they built a ramp using straws and duct tape, and the buddy started to go up the ramp, but what happened? The buddy fell off. So they tried to take some cardboard tubes and you know, cut them longitudinally, but they were too curvy. So anyhow, in the first stage, they were just tinkering a little bit. Okay. And the, the each of the four-year-old, he got kind of interested in making an alternative entryway into the, to the home. That was what he was invested in. And his sister started to create a world for Buddy. And that this is kind of a rural you know, family. And then we've got a you know, bit of apples and a bit of pumpkins. And all of that got incorporated into this really beautiful story of which I'll only share a little piece for time's sake. in the next slide. Here. So there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm just tinkering with the materials. Um, and while this is a story that happened in a home, I could easily see this kind of thing going on in a classroom. You could vary so many things, different recycled materials, different building materials, you know, and then see what story challenges and solutions develop. This is a bit of the story. Second place I love to go to, the park. No, 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 Solomon. Solomon. And he loved Solomon. Oh, it was really fun. But then finally he rushed his way through because he was only a kid. Was like, oh. So he rushed his way through. And the front of the giants helped him back in. And then he went to play. He's going home. Yes, he's going home. He was going home, but the friendly giants had to help him because the way seems a little harder. <laughs> okay.
There's no place like home, but it makes it. So the next time I visited, I brought a few other bugs, and we took a look at how they were a little bit different, and, you know, how they were the same, and they noticed that the legs, some of them had gaps between the legs, and some of them didn't, and some of them had bristles on the top, and one of them they, they named Hangy, you know, it was hanging off the tube there, and then there were, they decided to have two boys and two girls, um, <coughs> Mina's the mom, you know, Buddy, like, Lily, and Hangy. <laughs> Oops, and um, they both, oops, sorry, they both worked with these things at, again, levels that they were comfortable for them. Um, I know you mentioned Mitch Resnick earlier, and his course, which is ongoing, um, also has for free excerpts from his book. So everything is free, and it's intended to build this community around creative learning. And I have to say, I started it, and then we had six days without power in Maine, and a tree fell across my yard. But I'm planning to get back to it, because it was really fun. And um, it's all right there, and it's just really interesting stuff. So, um, so then the children had wanted to look at the hex bug movements, and you know, a low threshold is something that Kate quotes Mitch about um, of, of you know, low threshold of floor, so it's easy to get started in some cases. A high ceiling, many ways to expand challenges, and wide walls, many different ways to explore different domains. So, you know, in the beginning, a little boy, he really just wanted to master assembling tubes and, and working with masking tape. That was kind of new for him. And then they decided to build a tunnel and work together and let the bugs, you know, come through and, and see how that would work when they put two bugs in from each side. So they're doing a lot of experimentation. The little girl, she decided that she wanted to see if the bugs moved differently. They had different legs, or were they going to move differently? And so she decided to follow them with markers. So she had a different marker for each bug, and so she let the bugs go, and then she decided to track them. And see, you know, the larger bugs seem to go in a straight line, so she was just starting to explore that. And you can see she has lots of papers where she's kind of thinking about, you know, how these different bugs have different legs and how are they moving. Okay, so it can it be, we're 10 years here together, and we, um, thanks to Diane and, and Lynn Hartle and Juana, uh, this is just to show, you don't have to be an expert to use technology. You can, this is an, an app called Clips, that's from Apple, and uh, we, last night after a conference day, we decided to play with it and see what would happen. Get ready. It also uses some, you know, voice uh, speech Get ready. text. We start out from different places. May travel here differently. <laughs> but we know where we are headed. <laughs> Listen, empower, and go deep. At NAEYC with y'all and the bees. <laughs> That's it. Take it away. Wow. <laughs> We gotta do something, right? Done last night in her hotel room. <laughs> wow. We had fun. May not be polished, may not be Hollywood. And well, we learned about Eclipse, the app. Yeah. I'm gonna dumb this down a bit. <laughs> bring it right down to where it needs to be. First of all, I gotta make Get sure. Get ready. Yeah, I think I got a better. Um, <laughs> wow. So, um, how do you follow up wisdom, stress, and pain? And when you go up, and and I don't know what. And, 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 uh, and, and lots of. Did you notice all the bugs in this? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Last year we both did pumpkins, and then somehow I had hex bugs, not bug bugs. So I've been trying to use the technology and. Uh, sort of make make my daily activities as a teacher and and um, so drive the technology and not the other way around so as these guys have been talking I've been taking notes with this pencil and just doodling and so I can do this so I can quickly review everything everybody said starting with Mark's support don't supplant that's why I asked him to use some Smaller words, uh, but some of the key questions: passion, play, peer, lead with your pedagogy, real reality, the pro scope. And it was so cool the way, in all all three of these cases, 
how building around a child's interests drove how the technology is used. And I think what I hope you guys have, have um, taken from this is that we're exploring. We're trying to figure all this out. We're not saying anything's good or bad. And we love to get together and share. And I think that's what brings us all to the same place. And so it's so fun to be, uh, be back with these guys. And how time flies. Uh, so, um, so I, um, isn't this cool? So I'm using an iPad Pro and, and Procreate. What's the app that you were just using? Uh, it's called Pro Procreate. 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 It's easy to remember if yeah. you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds gonna, sexy, Warren. But so, do but it, does it come um, not an Apple? It uh, it's only Apple? on the iPad uh, Pro or the, the uh, it, it needs the pencil. Actually, it, it will work with your finger. It's just not as cool. And I, I had to be a little bit cooler than everybody else because it's just part of it here. So. Yeah, so I don't know if it actually is or not, but um, so here's some things that I've been thinking about and seeing that I thought I'd bring to this conversation, and uh, this is in 2009 I found this photo. Oh, wow. gracious. Okay. Wow. And we had just done the, the fist bump because oh, that had yeah. to come out, and we did the exp yeah. so we need to do that again. Okay. okay. So um, look how young we are. <laughs> My gosh, we look amazing. Um, so my news this year is C-Trex. So I, I started uh, reviewing software in 1993, and um, that's 25, 24 years ago. So talk about feeling old. And this, this latest version uh, I'm very excited about because it lets you create your own rubrics. So Diana and I were talking about the hospital, so we could actually create a rubric for use in a hospital, and you can look at every new product that comes out, and it gets shared. So the uh, acronym is uh, CTR Exchange, E-X is for exchange. And so I'm really proud of this because it works on mobile devices, so you can, you can actually, um, that's our latest thing. And there's a section for early childhood, and I am an early childhood educator. I'm proud to say I made snacks, and uh, I know what it's like. And so, um, working at High School Foundation for 10 years tuned me into things called key experiences. So whenever I look at any of these uh, technology things, I'm always thinking about what kinds of processes does it free and enable. And using that lens is very useful for understanding something like all those coding activities. And I want to uh, emphasize something. Uh, Mitch Resnick was uh, in our, our uh, area two weeks ago. Uh, Chip was there and we heard him speak. And he was asked to speak about uh, keeping Papert's dream alive. As, as many of you know, Seymour Papert passed away last year. And uh, so the question that Mitch was trying to grapple with was like, what, how can we keep the ideas of Pepper going for another 10 years? And when you start looking at all of the coding activities that are coming out, one thing Mitch said was, there, he said, I don't have anything, any problem with puzzles. However, I want, and Pepper, and I think he's channeling Pepper, would want the, whatever the child's doing to go deep. So I think Pepper would like the bug. And I don't think Pepper would be as excited about coding games that don't really, that sort of are one and done. And so I think it's important to always remember that you, coding right now is, as Robin Reston says, it's the new Mandarin. I mean, it's really sexy right now. Uh, always look at these things by watching the child and asking what thing is it unlocking or empowering them with. So, um, so I want to play this quick uh, game, and this includes us bees. Um, what has become obsolete in the 10 years since we started doing this panel just because of this device, this smartphone? So take a quick brainstorm and talk to the person next to you. 
what kinds of things have become obsolete in the last 10 years since we've been meeting? Go ahead and talk for a second. Taxi cab. Here's a few that uh, other groups have come up with. Can you see if your if, is yours up there, or are there any that were forgotten? A thermostat. What? A beeper. Yeah. Remember the pages that are underneath the chair? Yeah. Doctor Seuss. Anything else? I mean, I just think it's so amazing that you can take such incredible pictures with your flashlight. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, Dictionary. It doesn't help you. If you want to do, you know, shovel snow and you need your headlamp, you need both hands <laughs> for shoveling. So, you know, that, that, there's a different kind of flashlight that we need. So, the, the point of this is that, um, you notice the paper weight at the end. It's very good for holding on papers in here. Um, that so much has changed and technology is, in, in just in the last 10 years. Uh, the iPad is, uh, is seven years old now, and you know, in the time that we've been meeting, uh, we really started meeting in the past, and you know, in the olden days when we were talking about this, we were excited about, we were using, I mean the computers we used were incredible. Um, and now we're in the future, and I think it's safe to say that, you know, with multi-touch, um, so, uh, it's a cool time to be alive, but it comes with a cost. And the cost is that if you've got a closed mind, uh, you're gonna, you might be frustrated, you might, it's easy to put your head in the sand and say, I just don't like this new stuff. And I think there are people that romanticize childhood of, of the past, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, I had a lot of good time with mud and, and playing in, in mud puzzles and stuff. This doesn't take mud puddles away. And that's really important to understand that we always have to be role models and our children deserve adults who are curious, who will explore this, will find out what's good and what's not good and, and always uh, keep their interest in mind. So um, as mentioned before, the, the position statement is five years old and it's wonderful to have one of the authors in the audience in the house. Give it up for Chip. Yeah. And who's next to him but uh, Rick of the Fred Rogers Center. I mean, yeah. that, this only happens at any event. So they'll be up doing uh, autographs at the end. But um, this, is, this was such an important document and um, the Erickson Center has been keeping up with the research. And so we have tools. Uh, they're this, this topic needs, just like sunshine, you know, it, 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 um, it scares away the ignorance and we need it more than ever. Uh, so three emerging technologies that, that I've been watching as a reviewer. One is uh, the technology Mark showed was exciting, uh, but I was just as exciting to see uh, a 399, 55-inch uh, 4K screen. For, that's 400 bucks. That's the cost of a mountain bike, pretty much. Pretty mediocre one, but a medium one. Um, that um, I can use in my classroom to do that replay that I just did. Or I can take it, my camera, and I can do everything when a bug crawls into the room. I can use uh, a lens on my smartphone. I can Apple TV it, and I can walk around, and I can put it up on the big screen. Uh, we had five kids come in uh, visiting our library in MediaTek where I do a lot of my testing. It's a public library. These were kids who just had come into the country. They didn't speak English. And um, because of the, the political climate, the school system was trying to make them uh, feel uh, at home with the resources of the community. So they asked me to show them around. So I'm walking around and I asked the question, where are you from? 
The translator, because they didn't speak English, said various places in Latin America. So rather than just say, oh, that's nice, I started up, and I didn't plan this, I started up Google Earth. And I said, tell me exactly where you live. And I let them touch the map. And you know how Google Earth zooms in? I mean, their faces lit up and it was that big. So you can use the surface to magnify and empower. And I think that is so wonderful. And I'm excited because 400 bucks, how much did your thing cost, Mark? Don't even tell us. 450. <laughs> yeah, right. Plus a few. Right. Plus oh, there know, was a comment there. This, yes, you're right. this guy has a computer that costs as much as a Toyota Corolla right, up, right over there. I'm pretty jealous of that computer. Yeah, we like um, so I want to just dig a little deeper in. You know, this is Walmart um, an hour ago. You can, you can really get some deals on Black Friday. And use this technology so that the child controls the, the pixels, not the other way around. Did you understand that? I would have written that down in my thing. So the child controls the screen. And that's what Mitch would say, right? Not the other way around, where you're pushing linear media at them, or you know, ideas from the outside that aren't theirs. Uh, use it to support their thinking. So another thing that's really exciting is voice recognition. Uh, right now, Apple is listening to every word that we're saying, if you have any kind of device on your wrist. So I can prove it. I can say, hey Siri. See, I'm waking up all your devices, right? <laughs> it's a joke. <coughs> now you're all going, ah, stop it. Um, but it's pretty wild that they, they, there's five, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven microphones that are listening and they can pick voices out of a crowd. How many people have played with an Echo, an Amazon Echo? So that was the first one. And lately, uh, Google has come out. Oh, wait, I think I have a, a link here. Let me try this. It's OK. I'll, do, I'll make this work. No, maybe. Yeah, I have to go here. No, I just won't do that. Um, so I can play SpongeBob Challenge. I just reviewed an app that you can't see or you can't touch. So it's operated with your voice. And it's a memory game with SpongeBob. And uh, you know, you take an order and you have to remember what you hear. Uh, there are bedtime stories. There are all kinds of quizzes. There's animal quizzes. A lot of it's pretty low quality because the early childhood educators haven't gotten involved in making content for these devices yet. But there is a whole new pipeline that just opened.